And to close the day, um, our final speaker of the day is none other than the inimitable Aaron Patterson. Woo Woo. Yeah. Aaron is the self-proclaimed -pro uncle of Rails. Cool uncle, I think he said. Cool uncle, cool yes, uncle. sorry, I forgot that detail. Prototypical Ruby and Rails developer, even though he does mostly C and Rust these days. And an all-around lovely person. Please give a round of applause for Aaron. I love you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> ah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ufuk. Uh, thank you, Andy. I'm, I'm, not, I'm the fun uncle is what I am. Just want to make sure that that's clear, the fun uncle. Um, <laughs> So I want, to start off, I want to start off today with a few random facts. Um, the first random fact I want to give you is that Ruby actually uses pseudo-random numbers, meaning it's not perfectly random. Uh, the next random fact I want to tell you is that you can use srand to control, the, like, control your random numbers. So if you need like, stable random numbers, you can use that. Um, why aren't these jokes landing? Oh my god. <laughs> My next, my, my next random fact is that you can instantiate a new random object using the random class. So if you need a new random, random like, instance, you can do that. But also, I was thinking, like, random class, that's not good enough. What I really, really want is a random class. So I wrote this, um, and it gives you a random class. So, I mean, if somebody wants to package this up as a gem and release it, you're, go, go for it, please. You can do this. Anyway, the reason, the reason I wanted to give all of these random facts today is because I feel like random facts these days, they're not normally distributed. So I wanted to tell you all these. <laughs> we still have an hour left, right? OK. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm so I'm really really happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here today. It's great to be it's great to be in the Motor City. Uh, I heard that this is where Rails engines were invented. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to talk about Rails engines, but then I decided to have some uh, active record reflections. Uh, I have as many covers as Andy does, so I hope you're all prepared for this. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this conference. It was great to see Nadia's opening talk about her company, The Storygraph. It was a really, really inspiring, uh, inspiring presentation. Like, I'm, yes. I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly interested in starting a company, but her, like, her talk was so inspiring. I was like, wow, maybe I should start a company. I will not, but it, it, was, it was that good. I really enjoyed the way that she used graphs to tell a story about her company. A, a story graph, if you will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Irina's, Irina's talk was also incredible. I really enjoyed hearing so many stories about all the, different, all the different startups using Ruby on Rails, building successful businesses with Ruby on Rails. It really made me feel good to hear these, hear these stories. I enjoyed getting the feedback for, that she delivered to our community, how we can improve Ruby and Rails and, and improve our ecosystem, uh, especially telling people to be loud about the framework that we, that we use and love. I think that's really important. However, yes. Please. I have, to, I have to admit, though, that being on the Rails core team, like some of the, some of the feedback that she gave was a little bit hard for me to take. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure how to react. Uh, <laughs> uh, I enjoyed John's talk on Vernier as well. Uh, I actually used, after his presentation, I used his profiler to shave about 10 minutes off of this presentation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so if you're tired of these jokes, like uh, he he helped reduce them. Uh, 
<laughs> Actually, when he first put, to, put up his website, like he put up this website and he sent me a DM and I was extremely confused because he said to me, hey, check out my PFP. And I was like, what? <laughs> and it turned out it was a profiler page. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Let's go out, move on to the next jokes. Uh, I, really enjoyed, I really enjoyed Hack Day, it was a ton of fun. Uh, I helped some folks work on a feature, so like adding, adding a callback to uh, active storage so that we could know when a, when a file had been uploaded, we could get a callback. I thought that was a lot of fun. I also helped somebody running Lobster as we were trying to track down a memory leak in his application. Uh, and in fact, like Lobsters is a Rails application. You should check out this website if you haven't. This is a great website. It is a Rails app, and I think that's so awesome. So to Irina's point about being loud about, uh, about um, who uses Rails, I, I want to do that on stage too. So I'm really happy to be here in Detroit. It's my very, very first time here, my first time in Michigan. I'm so happy to be here. I tried to do all of like the local Detroit stuff. I went on, I rode on the People Mover. Uh, it was a moving experience. I, I heard that there, I was really excited to come here because I heard that there was like a statue built of our uh, most beloved like uh, uh, Ruby linting library, Rubocop. Uh, and it's true, there is a statue. This is the statue. I haven't seen it. It's locked in somebody's garage. But there is a Rubocop statue here. It's incredible. Uh, I ate some of the Detroit-style pizza. It was delicious. Um, also, block cheese, amazing. I, I am not good at geography. I thought that Coney Island was in New York. Um, <laughs> But it is not, I went, to, I went to this place, I got a Coney Island hot dog, it was delicious. I got the Lafayette Coney Island hot dog, this is it, it was good. Now some of the things I haven't been able to do, I have, that I've missed out on so far, I have not been to a party store yet. I heard that they are all the rage, but I don't, I don't know, I haven't been there. Um, also, I have yet to visit our um, neighbors to the south, uh, Canada. <laughs> 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 All right, my, my name is Aaron Patterson. I go by Tender Love Online. You can find me on the socials as that. Uh, I started a live stream. Like I've been, I've been doing a live stream on YouTube mainly as a way to amortize the cost of my green screen. So like, <laughs> you know, also I'm really proud of this live stream because they don't just give them to anybody. Like I'm, I feel so happy about it. Anyway, please, like, please join me for the live stream, but don't forget to like, subscribe, and to comment below. Of course, uh, it really helps the channel. Really helps the channel. Like, <laughs> we're only about 97,000 <laughs> subscribers away. <right? laughs> almost there. Almost there, everybody. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I mostly stream about like Ruby internals and Rails internals and just different stuff I think is fun or exciting. And I, I absolutely take requests. So if there's stuff that you want to know about, like any type of Ruby or Rails internals things that you would like to know more about, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to stream about pretty much anything. Um, I work for a tiny startup company called Shopify. Uh, I'm on the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team, and our team, our team has about 36 people on it, and I measured that by looking at the number of people in the Slack channel, so I'm not exactly sure. I think that's the number. Uh, we're, we're divided into three different teams, the Ruby infrastructure team, the, uh, which focuses on developing the Ruby, Ruby itself, the Ruby language. We're also divided into the Rails infrastructure team. They focus on the, rail, on the Rails side of things. And we also have the Ruby DX team, which is a, DX stands for uh, developer experience. So it's kind of, kind of weird if you think about it, because we have like language, a language development team, a framework development team, and then, and then like a developer experience team. But when you think about this, these, uh, Think about the, the responsibilities that each of these teams have. It's, it's a very cohesive environment. And what I mean is like it's good to have developer experience working closely with uh, language, language developers and framework developers because that way we can deliver the, the best experience possible for uh, developers at Shopify and, and outside of Shopify. Uh, for example, the DX team works on language servers. Uh, they develop the Ruby LSP. 
uh, as well as the Rails plugins for the Ruby LSP. They do lots of work on IRB. So any, any places where, where developers are like interacting with the language, they're, they're touching that. Uh, one great example is, uh, of this collaboration is in Ruby 3.3, there is a new gem called Prism. If you think about, uh, you think about all the responsibilities of um, uh, developer experience, a lot, of those, a lot of those tasks involve doing static analysis of code, and we needed a way that we could parse Ruby, Ruby code well, get, get error messages out of it, uh, a, as well as do transformations on, on ASTs, things like that. So we developed this, well, Kevin developed this, um, a parser called Prism. It's really easy to use. You can just like parse some code, you get back an AST, and you can work with it. Uh, build any tools on top of it that you want to. And this is an example of how uh, the DX team works so well with the language, language and framework teams. Uh, I talked a lot about developer experience last year, and it's, it's so last year, but it's also this year as well as the following years too. Uh, <laughs> but this year I wanna talk more about I want to talk more about the other teams' uh, speed, specifically. Our teams are responsible for increasing speed, and I think about that like as increasing developer productivity as well as like increasing the speed of the language and the framework. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about Rails stuff, like Rails stuff that we've been working on and Ruby stuff that we've been working on as well. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is Rails. Excuse me, Rails stuff. I'm going to talk about a couple changes in Rails. Uh, things that are coming up in future releases. So the first, first thing I want to touch on has, has any of, you, any of you heard of the Ruby tag? You know this in HTML? Yeah, we've got a couple, couple folks in the audience. Okay. So this is, like, this is what it looks like. So uh, it's just an HTML tag. And what it's used for is it's used for pronunciation. So in this case, um, we're displaying some uh, kanji characters, some Chinese characters, and then we display how you actually pronounce those characters. When you render it, it looks like this. So it has little text above each of the Chinese characters to tell you how to pronounce them. And we're actually adding a Ruby tag helper to Rails. Like this is the Ruby tag helper. You can use this uh, with, with Rails so that you can have Ruby on Ruby on Rails. This tag helper is coming in future as well as previous and current versions of Rails. <laughs> All right, so actually, let, let's, let, let's stop the bullshit now. Let's, maybe. <laughs> All right, so uh, the, first, the first feature I want to touch on is enabling widget in production by default. This is, this is the title of the pull request. Uh, if you're using Ruby 3.3 in future versions of Rails, we will, we will enable Widget by, product, or by default in production. Uh, we're, using it, we're using it at work in our production applications. We're seeing about a 15% performance improvement, but we've had reports of speed ups that are even better than that. So it depends on your workload, but check it out. Like, if, you, if you're in an environment that's not memory constrained, it's basically just free performance for you, so you should check it out. Uh, you, can, you can actually enable Widget today. You can beat the line. <laughs> Act now. All, all, we do, all we do is we generate this initializer. This is basically the entire change. We generate this initializer, and when the application boots, it'll run this initializer. If you want to do it today, just copy this initializer into your application. What's nice about this initializer, though, is that uh, we, we actually wait until after the application has been booted to enable Widget. We added a, a uh, method to Widget such that we can enable the method, or we can enable the JIT when we want to, like during runtime. And I think this is a great example of how, the, how this particular team, the language team, as well as the framework team and the DX team are working together to give good features. We're able to say like, hey, I don't want to JIT all of the boot time stuff because we don't really care about the boot time stuff. It's not going to be serving things to our customers. We care about the runtime stuff. So we'll say, hey, we're going to wait until after, after we booted to enable widget. So this will reduce our memory, but also give us better speed for, for responses. So please take this code, do it in your app. Um, the, next, the next feature is pretty interesting. This, this, is, this PR is a proof of concept PR. A uh, follow-up, this PR didn't land, but a follow-up one did that, that um, added the functionality. And what it is is we wanted to add an option to disable connection caching. This is kind of weird, like a weird feature, but I'm going to tell you why I think this is a really cool feature. So 
when you access a connection in Rails, you might do something like this where you say active record base connection, and that'll hand you back a connection, but it caches the connection and it always returns the same connection over and over again. What this feature is, this feature will make this method raise an exception <laughs> so that you can't do that. Uh, and what we want you to do is migrate to this particular, this particular um, code. You say like with connection, you get a block, it gives you the connection, you use the connection, and then it passes the connection back. So the problem with the previous API is that we don't actually know when you're done with that connection, so we can't hand it off to any other threads to use. If you use this block form, then we actually know when you're done, when you're done with the connection, and we can give it to somebody else. Uh, here is, you can read about the configuration setting here, but basically all it does is it, it just changes that method to raise an exception if you try to use the method, or you can have it emit a warning so you can like uh, slowly migrate. But I have to really stress here, like if you're happy, if you use that method, that connection method, and you're happy with the way that your application works, don't change anything. It's really, really fine for you to do this. Um, like go ahead and do that. The, the point behind this, like, the point behind this feature is, like, why, you know, why would we want this? The reason we want it is for applications that have high concurrency and parallelism. So, for example, let's say we have some code that looks like this. This is my, like, really poor Puma web server or something. Um, when we're checking out a database connection here, we're required to have at least 10, at least 10 connections in our database pool. And unfortunately, like, in this particular code example, we, we're not using that connection for the entire lifetime of the thread. We're doing some work, and then we get the connection, and then maybe we do some more work, but we only use that connection for a very short time. So we could reduce the number of connections we have open to the database, uh, but we can't do it in this case because we don't know when you're gonna be done with it. So what we do, what we prefer is that you use with connection, then you can do all of your code inside, anything with the connection inside this block, then we know that other threads are free to, use, free to use that connection. Now, hopefully, you won't even need to care about this because you're probably using Active Records APIs. If you're just going through Active Record objects, we already do all of this stuff for you, so you don't even really need to worry about it. The main use case for this change is for you to find places that are using too many connections and then reduce the number of connections that you need to your database. But again, like I really have to stress, if you're happy, change nothing. It's great. Just keep going on with your life. It is fine. Now, I want to talk about, like, we're going to dive into something here. We're going to talk about concurrency and parallelism in Ruby. This is going to be a whirlwind tour. I'm sorry. I like low-level stuff, and that is what we will talk about today. I want, to, I want to talk about specifically CRuby. We're not talking about JRuby or other, other implementations. I am on the Ruby core team, not the JRuby core team, so <laughs> I am biased. But I want to give you a fact here. No CPU-bound code in CRuby can run in parallel, period, except for the exceptions. One exception is inside of reactors, which we're not going to cover today, and they have to be inside the same process. So if you have one process, CPU-bound code cannot run in parallel, no matter what you do. So let me give you an example here. Here we have, we're building, like, I feel like this is a very common use case in our field is we're building a Fibonacci as a service. <laughs> this code cannot be run in parallel. It just cannot be. If we run, if we wrap all of these with threads, uh, our code will not get any faster. This will not improve speed whatsoever. Uh, if we wrap it with fibers, this will also not run in parallel. It will do nothing. This will run in the, amount, the same amount of time. Uh, even if we reach for something like, hey, let's use, uh, uh, I don't know, promises and execute all this, this, will, this, will, this won't help at all either. I promise. Actually, I find a lot of people use promises for uh, deferring calculations, and I wanted to show you my, fra my favorite uh, framework for doing calculation deferment. So let me show you here. This is, this is what I want to do. We have this code here. We're calculating, we're calculating Fibonacci sequence. We have our Fib20 there, and we want to defer that calculation until after we've done the other work, okay? We need to do that after we've done the other work. So my, like... The, the framework that I really like to use in these sorts of situations is basically I take this line and then I move it there. <laughs> I 
Yes. <laughs> I really, really like this technique. The reason I like it is it's easy to debug, it's easy to refactor, it's easy to read. So please, I really encourage you to use this move code around technique. <laughs> so the next time you want to reach for some sort of parallelization, like, framework or something, think about what I'm telling you. CPU bound code cannot run in parallel, so if you need to defer the calculation, maybe just refactor. So we have all these parallelization tools, but I just told you no, none, of these, none of this code can run in parallel, so what the heck is all this stuff for? Uh, I, I said earlier no CPU bound code runs in parallel, and th this is the key word here, no CPU bound code runs in parallel, but IO bound code absolutely run, will run in parallel. So what we want to do is, when we're building our Fibonacci as a service service, instead of actually calculating Fibonacci, what we want to do is call out to another service that calculates Fibonacci. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll call into somebody else's fast. Uh, <laughs> So when we're, when we're doing something like this, we can wrap it with threads, and this will definitely run in parallel. This will speed up your code, because we're using IO We're using IO here. Now, unfortunately, let's say we wrap them in fibers. This will not execute it in parallel. This will not, this will not speed up our code, and the reason is because fibers use something called cooperative scheduling. So you can think of the difference between threads and fibers as uh, threads, have, threads are fibers, but they have a scheduler built in. They automatically know when to switch between each other, where fibers, you have to say, hey, I need you to go run this code. You have to opt into switching. So if you're going to use fibers, you have to either implement your own, uh, you have to implement your own scheduler or maybe use a, use a library that implements a scheduler. So you can think of fibers as threads but without a scheduler. So in this case, like, probably you don't want to write your own scheduler. You should use something like async. That's exactly what this gem does, is implement a scheduler for fibers. And it allows you, that allows you to run IO in parallel with fiber objects. So the question is like, fibers or threads? Both of them allow you to run IO in, in parallel. Which one should I choose? And I think a lot of people say, well, fibers are lightweight, and I really hate it when people say this, because what does lightweight mean? Like, I, I don't like these squishy terms. I want to know, why, what, do, what do you mean by lightweight? So, what, what they mean when they say that fibers are lightweight is that you can create and destroy fiber objects more quickly than you can create and destroy thread objects. But the code that you execute inside of either a fiber or a thread will execute at the same speed. So it's nothing to do with the code that you put inside of those fibers, but everything to do with creating and destroying those particular objects. Uh, the other issue is that threads will typically use more memory than fibers will, for example. Uh, now, it's kind of hard for me to decide which one of these to choose because like, if you're putting stuff inside of a thread or a fiber, it's probably your bottleneck because you want to run that thing in parallel. Um, but if that is the slow thing, then if your code is the slow thing, then does it really matter how fast, it, how fast creating a new thread is? So you have to kind of make this decision. Do I want to import another library for scheduling or do I just want to use a thread? And if this is making your head spin, it also makes my head spin as well. So, here are some guidelines that I like to go by when trying to figure out which one of these to use. First, if you have a CPU-bound problem, refactor your code. Uh, if you have a few database queries that you need to do, use threads. Or even better, don't use threads. Use this method called load async. And I'm going to stop here for a second because I want you all to go read this article on load async. What this is for is if you have a, like a, an active record object, you're doing an active record query like user.where.where.where, blah, 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 blah. If you tack on a load async to that, it'll actually do that query in a background thread for you automatically. So you don't need to worry about thread management whatsoever. Now, let's say in the case I have uh, thousands of connections. I need to handle tons and tons of connections. Like I'm building a chat server. That's what I'm doing. There, there's only two apps. There's Fibonacci servers and chat servers. That's it. <laughs> If we have tons of connections, then use fibers, something like async or falcon. Um, so how does all this stuff relate to the original feature that I, that I was talking about? Uh, well, when I was talking about whether we could use fibers or threads or whatnot, at the very beginning of the process was figuring out whether or not we're using, our application is I.O. bound or CPU bound. Are we building a FAS or are we building, <laughs> are we building a, F-T-O-C-A-Y-N. <laughs> and the truth is, 
none of us are building applications like that. If you look at the workload of your application, it's probably gonna fall somewhere in between these two. And if you're building an app in, in between these two areas, like you can probably optimize the number of database connections that you do because some of your requests are gonna be mostly CPU and some of your requests are gonna be mostly I.O. or a mix of them. So it's possible for you to use this feature in order to serve more requests with fewer database connections. So you can share those connections among threads. Uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, the work we've been doing in the Ruby, Ruby sphere. Um, our team works on YJIT. It is a JIT compiler built into Ruby. Uh, as I said, our Rails app in production uses YJIT, and that is our main target. Like, that, that app, that Rails app is our main target for speeding things up. Uh, coming in Ruby 3.4, we're working on a register allocator, and I'm not gonna go into the details of this too much because it is um, way too much. I don't have time to do that. But basically what it does is when we're building, <laughs> when we're building our fi Fibonacci as a service, I don't know why I use Fibonacci for all these, these examples. I think I stole this one from John. Anyway, um, when, you're, when you're working with local variables, for example, this Fibonacci function, it's using local variables for doing calculations. These local variables, we save and read values in memory. So whenever we save a value, we have to save that value into the computer's memory. And when we read the value, we have to read that back out of, read that back out of the computer's memory. And going to memory is actually very slow. We do not want to go to memory. Instead, what we would like to do is we would like to keep those values inside of registers because they're very close to the CPU and we can use those much quicker. Uh, so that's going to be coming in Ruby 3.4. Um, but the point of this, like, this stuff is very, very cool, but I, as I said, we're not focusing on benchmarks like Fibonacci at all. We are really, really focusing on Rails applications. And I, I also mentioned we're seeing about 15% speed improvement, but what's really cool is, since we're targeting such a big application like this, we're able to make really good improvements within the ecosystem uh, as a whole. So I wanna show an example. We wrote a uh, protobuf library called protobuf. Uh, it is a pure Ruby protobuf, protobuf parsing library, and Maxime is gonna be giving a presentation about this at uh, RubyKaigi next week. But what's really cool is we are able to, we're, this is comparing our pure Ruby protobuf library with Google's protobuf library that is written in C. We're able to outperform their, their library by nine times. So we are nine times faster. Uh, we, are, we were also able to implement a GraphQL parser that was able to outperform a C-based GraphQL parser. Uh, and the reason that we're doing all this is because we want to make... <laughs> we want to make Ruby performance so good that you don't need to reach for languages like C or Rust or something else. We want to make it so good that you're just staying in Ruby all the time. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is object shapes. We, we introduced this technique in Ruby 3.2. Uh, but we've made some improvements on it in Ruby 3.3, and I want to highlight those improvements. But first, I'm going to go over what, the, what object shapes are and how they work, and then we'll see what the problems are and how we fix, how we fix those problems. So instance variables in Ruby are stored in an array. So we store all of those in an array, but clearly, like, when you're writing your code, you don't write an array index in your code. You write a name. You, you write the name of the instance variables. We have to have a way to map that name to an index, an array index, and the thing that we use for doing that is uh, object shapes. So we use object shapes to map these names to indices. This uh, technique uses a very large tree data structure. We call this tree data structure the shape tree. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how this tree works. So let's say we have an object like this, a node object. It sets a few instance variables, color, key, left, and right. And the way that, the way that this works is, all objects start out at the root of this shape tree. So we say, uh, when we first allocate this node, it's gonna start here at zero, at the root of the shape tree. So uh, we'll allocate node, and when, when we go to assign an instance variable, we're gonna say, well, okay, we're gonna assign the color instance variable, and we're gonna follow an edge in that tree called color. So we'll follow that edge, and that'll transition the node object to shape number one. And we're gonna repeat this for each of, the, each of the instance variables. So when we set key, we're gonna follow the key, the key um, edge and go to shape two. 
Same with left, we'll follow the left edge, go to shape three, and then with right, we'll go to shape four. Uh, each node in this tree has an ID, and that ID is associated with the object as we add instance variables to the object. Now let's imagine that we have a second class over here, node two. It's very similar to the first class, but we set the instance variables in a different order. So we'll set, a, we'll set color, it'll follow that same path. It starts off at zero, goes to one. Uh, then we'll set key, it goes to two. But now we have to set the instance variable right, and we don't have an outgoing edge with the name right. So we'll actually create a new node, link that in with an outgoing edge called right, and we'll follow that. And then this node has no children, but we have to assign the left instance variable, so we'll create a new node with an outgoing edge called left. Now, the thing to know about this is it means that many objects can share the same shape. We saw during that process, those two objects at certain points had the same shape. Uh, the only thing that the shape tree cares about are the instance variable names and the order in which they were set. So if I can give you a pro tip in your applications, it is try to set instance variables in the same order in your objects. Now, as I said earlier with ActiveRugger based connection stuff, if you like the way your app is written, don't change it. You don't need to do this. <laughs> but if you want to, like this, this can help your performance. So I wanna step through this process once more, but we're gonna look a little bit more in detail. So again, we'll start off, we're gonna initialize this object. We'll start off at shape zero once we've entered the initialize method. We'll follow this down and we're gonna set the color method. We're, we're starting here with an empty tree. Before we had a full tree, now we're gonna start with an empty tree. When we set the color instance variable, we have to check, like, was this, was this instance variable set before? Because if it was, we'll have to reuse that index. But we're at the root, the root shape here, so we, we, we've never set this before, so we'll create a new node with an outgoing edge of color, and we'll, we'll set the instance variable at zero on that with that uh, value. Now we're gonna do the same thing for key. So we say, all right, have we ever set the key instance variable before? Because if we have, we need to reuse its index. So we check, uh, is key equal to color? No, it is not. We go up to the root node, we know that we're done. Say, okay, we've never set this before, so we're gonna add a new node. So we do that. And then we have the left instance variable. Again, we have to check, have we set the left instance variable before? So we'll check, well, is uh, key equal to left? No. Is color equal to left? No. So we add another node. And I hope you can see where we're going with this. We have to do the same thing with the right. So when we set right, we have to check all the way up the tree. Have we ever set this value before? Go, keynote, yes. And no, we haven't, so we'll create a new node. Now, the thing to know about this is instance variable, the instance variable index is equal to the depth of the tree. So we can determine that index very, very easily. Uh, however, before we set an instance variable, we always have to check if an instance variable is defined. So this is very, very bad news for us because checking for an instance variable is an ON operation. We have to do, we have to check every single node in that tree. Did we, did we set that before? And even worse, it means that our initialized methods are probably N squared, which is not good if you're not familiar. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm saying here is the more, as we add more instance variables, the number of checks increases. So imagine we have an initialized method with N instance variables in it. So we set A1, A1 has to check zero parents. We set A2, that has to check one parent. A3 has to check two, A4 has to check three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we can actually write this out as a series like this. It's gonna be, the cost of our initialized method is gonna be one plus two plus three plus four. And we can take this series and rewrite it as a summation like this. And we can take that summation, I'm not gonna prove it to you here today, but we can take that summation and rewrite it as an equation like this. And if we multiply that n out, we'll actually see that we have an n squared there. And that is not good. We do not like n squared. Now, the good news is that most objects don't have that many instance variables, right? <laughs> better news, we have, we have inline caches, better news. So we're gonna talk about inline caches here for a minute. Uh, as in the previous examples, we're gonna look at the same example, but here we're gonna in introduce an inline cache. We always, again, we start out at zero, we add our color, our color instance variable, and it's, we have to do that same check, but here we introduce an inline cache. The key to this cache is the 
shape ID of the object, in this case, zero. The value of the cache is the next shape ID, in this case, one. Uh, we also store another value in there, which is the index of the instance variable that we're storing, in this case, zero. So we store that here, and then we do the same thing with at key. We'll do the same search, introduce this inline cache, do the same search, introduce the inline cache, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the second time that we execute this, this code, we'll go through, and again, we start off with uh, shape zero. It checks the inline cache. It's currently shape zero, it checks the inline cache. The keys match, we have a hit, so we don't search the tree. So our cache key is, is the shape, which is zero. Uh, the key hits, so we don't bother searching. And this is really great, and this is why I was saying it's good if you set instance variables in the same order, because we'll get very, very good cache hits, and we don't have to deal with searching this tree. So all of these will hit cache. Yay, cache. Go cache. Nice. Uh, and we don't have to worry about this anymore. Reading works the same way as writing, but we have to store, we don't have to store as much information on those inline caches. So in this example here, we're gonna read the value color. We have to search what is the, what is the index of color. Once we find that index, then we'll store an inline cache. And then the second time we call that, we hit the cache and we're good. So cache hits are great. Cache hits are constant time. We don't have to search this tree. Cache misses our ON. That's not great. So what we did in Ruby 3.3 is speed up these cache misses, and I want to talk about that now. So when do cache misses occur? Uh, we typically see cache misses when we're handling unexpected shapes. So the shape has to be something we didn't want. And I'm going to show a few examples that I think are common, common cases where this happens. Here's an example where we have a subclass. Our subclass is adding an instance variable, but it's using a method from the superclass. So our subclass will have a different shape than the superclass. And when we're using that read method, you can see, well, here we're gonna have, we're gonna have a cache miss when we use a subclass. A worse example is, let's say we have a subclass and we set an instance variable before calling super. Like I was saying earlier, we usually start off at shape zero, but this superclass, sometimes it starts at shape zero, sometimes at shape one, and we get really poor cache hits. Uh, another example here, I, I don't think, uh, th this is an example of using an or equals. If we use an or equals, we're gonna get a ton of different shapes because we don't know the order in which those or equals happens. But I think this one's fine. I don't think anybody actually uses this code, so <laughs> it's fairly rare. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you write code like this, it's fine. Don't worry, there's no judgment here. There's a judgment-free zone. Please continue to write code like this. So how can we speed this up? Uh, we saw earlier that all of these cases basically devolve to searching this, searching this shape tree. We have to go backwards through it linearly. We have to check each node one at a time. So how do we deal with this? Like, wouldn't, it would be really, really nice if we had a hash table at each line where we could say, at each node where we could say like, hey, let's check, is this thing in the hash? If it is in the hash, we know it's been defined. If it hasn't been in the, if it's not in the hash, then we know we need to do something else, create a new node. But a huge problem here is like, can you imagine writing some code like this in Ruby? You're gonna write a set, and that set's gonna contain color, and then you're gonna have to dupe the set and add one key, and then dupe the set again and add one key. Like, this is not great, because you don't wanna duplicate that set for every one of these nodes. We have all this duplicate information in here. So really what we want is we want some sort of data structure where we can get fast lookups and maybe have uh, multiple versions of that data structure. So we can say, hey, we have one, a version with one key, version with two, with three, et cetera. We really like a data structure that decreases duplication. So maybe we can share memory between each of these, each of these uh, hash tables. And actually we found a data structure like that. It's a functional red black tree. It's really great, it gives us very fast lookups, uh, but it also supports multiple versions, and these versions actually share memory with each other, so we can reduce our memory overhead. The one trick, though, or the one caveat to this red black tree is that you can't delete anything from the tree. So we can't delete anything from this tree, and that's, that's not great. However, uh, object shapes are never deleted, so this is not a requirement. <laughs> so, what we did is we introduced this, uh, this red-black tree in here to give a cache exactly like this, and I wanna share some benchmarks from it, uh, benchmarks from the results. So here's a benchmark. 
in this benchmark, you don't need to read, read the code too closely. What we're trying to do is we're trying to study, okay, let's give it an object, we're gonna keep adding instance variables to it, and instance variables, and we're gonna measure how long it takes to read an instance variable, and we're gonna do it in two cases. We're gonna do it where, when it hits cache and when it misses cache. So if we look at the output from this benchmark, we'll see on Ruby 3.2, when we hit cache, it's definitely constant time, that's great. But when we miss cache, you can see a linear increase in time like this. After we introduce this red-black tree in Ruby 3.3, this is what it looks like. So you can see as we add instance variables, even though we're missing cache, there's a little bit of overhead, but it's not that much at all, and it does not grow like the previous slide showed. Since I went through all the work to do those, I put them all on the same slide here, so I, I need, <laughs> need to amortize the cost of <laughs> making those benchmarks. So you can see here that linear increase, and our cat, like our red black tree cache is working extremely well even in, even in cache mi miss cases. Uh, let's look at the same example here, changing reads to writes. Um, exactly the same, but we're gonna write an instance variable. You can see here on Ruby 3.2, uh, again, like cache hits, constant time, cache, cache misses, we have ON time. Uh, then on Ruby 3.3, it's looking great here. Very little overhead when we miss caches. Now I wanna do, I wanna do one more example, um, memoization, I, another uncommon pattern, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so in this case, I wanna measure what is the time of checking whether or not an instance variable is defined. All of those previous cases that I showed you, the instance variables had already been defined. We were looking for an instance variable that exists. So how long does it take to find an instance variable that does not exist? What, is that, what does that look like? Uh, so I rewrote these benchmarks here, and what we're gonna do is instead of reading or writing, we're gonna check to find, and we're gonna check like how long does it take to find an instance variable that doesn't exist. So here is, I wanted you to brace yourselves, here is the benchmark results on Ruby 3.2. Wow. Our cache miss case is just as slow as our cache hit case. And it turns out that's because, well, we didn't actually have a cache on Ruby 3.2. <laughs> so we introduced the cache on Ruby 3.3. So this is gonna be really great. We're gonna love this next graph. Here is the next graph. Uh, this is Ruby 3.3. In this case, we always hit the cache on the bottom line and we're, we have constant time. Uh, but then when we miss the cache, it increases linearly, which is not exactly what I had anticipated when writing these slides. And it turned out it's because we forgot to add the red black tree, it was not using it. So I want you to look forward to Ruby 3.4 where the graph looks like this. <laughs> Thank you, yes. All right, enough slides. Let's wrap this up. I feel like I've been talking too much, so we're gonna quit now. Um, I, I have been a Rails developer since 2008. Uh, I've been coming to this conference for at least 10 years, and I love being a Ruby and Rails developer, and every time I come to this conference or go to any meetups or hang out with anybody in the Ruby and Rails community, I always think to myself, like, you know, back over these many years of being a Rails developer, when was the best time to be a Rails developer? When was that? Like, is there some sort of, like, heyday or golden era? And to me, the best time to be a Rails developer is now. Now is my favorite time to be a Rails developer. This yeah. is it. Yes, please. Every year, we're making the language and the framework faster, we're getting more efficient, and we're, we're having much more fun. Um, I'm very, very sad that next year will be the last RailsConf, uh, but since I'm giving the closing keynote here, it means that I have the penultimate word. <laughs> It is, it is sad that RailsConf is going to be ending, but I want to know, I want all of you to know that after this we can get together and I will Rails console you. <laughs> but don't, don't worry, <laughs> even though RailsConf is ending, we can DB migrate to another, another conference instead. <laughs> I want to thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be part of a friendly community that, that fosters an environment of learning and fun. It was great to give a presentation in front of all of you today. I hope that I will actually have the final word next year. That would be awesome. <laughs> but thank you so much.